So we're going to start, and you may have already talked about this with Joel, but we'll just go through this quickly. And this has to do with the insurance, your insurance licensing exam. So this is a sample of what your license will look like, right? I mean, I blotted out the name and the license number for privacy and what you need to know prior to your exam, right? So whether you take the exam remote testing or on-site testing, it's, it's still the same. It's just the tips are a little different. And this is, I don't have all of the remote testing on this PowerPoint. Hunter's filling that, that piece in, but I did go ahead and put in the things that you need to know for the on-site testing. So just to relieve any type of anxiety or anything that might come up uh, in regards to on-site testing or remote testing, how many of you are taking it on-site? Kristen, are you taking it on-site? Yeah, if I ever get a <laughs> test date. Oh, God. <laughs> I, I'm taking it on-site as well. Okay, Carissa, you're taking it on-site as well? Yes. All right, awesome. So everyone's taking fingerprinting on site or do I have to schedule that separately? You're going to have to schedule that separately so, and go somewhere else. And all okay. you have to do is Google life scan. Okay. If you Google life scan, it'll populate a bunch of sites near you. Just, um, I just did it at the UPS store yesterday. Oh, there you go. UPS. Okay. Yeah, I've gone yeah. and done it at UPS before. Yeah. And if you need the, 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 the worksheet for that or the document for that, just contact Hunter and Hunter will. Um, yeah, Hunter sent it to you. Yeah, good. So here's the checklist. First, most, and um, probably one of the most important things is you want to make sure that you've scheduled for the right exam. I can't tell you how many times we've had students scheduled for the wrong exam. No matter how many times we go over which exam they're taking, the fact that the certificate and your textbook or your course material as you're covering it is telling you what exam you're taking. Uh, it, we still get that one person every other month or twice a month that doesn't uh, schedule for the right test. So for everyone on this, uh, on this Zoom, your exam is life with accident and health. And then in parentheses, it reads life agent. So make sure that you've scheduled for the right exam. If you did not schedule for the right exam, and that would mean that you scheduled for life only or accident and health only, or maybe you scheduled for life, accident and health, but you scheduled for the Spanish exam, then you wanna make sure that you contact PSI at least three days before your test and you change the exam type. If they, are give, you, if they give you a hard time, say you wanna escalate it and tell them you wanna to speak to a supervisor. And if that continues to be an issue, then send them an email and you just have to keep following up with them, unfortunately, until they make the change. But generally speaking, um, pre-COVID, they were pretty easy. Or, I mean, they would take care of it. I don't know what it's like. I know, Kristen, you've had some issues with scheduling your exam. A nightmare. Yeah, yeah. So hopefully that's just, a, you know, an isolated situation and we don't mm. get that from other students. Uh, so check your email confirmation. Now, your email confirmation will say, bring your confirmation email with you. Now, you know, we live in a world where people, you know, they're, we're, we're tree friendly, so we don't want to print. And we have our devices that we carry with us everywhere we go. So as long as you have your device that says that you have, you know, here's your confirmation and you have the date, if they need it and you're not on their list, then you have it on your phone. Otherwise, uh, do not stress, it's okay, stay calm if you don't have a paper a confirmation with you, just show up. The one thing that you must show up, and if you don't have this, they will not let you take the exam, and that's valid picture ID. Your valid picture ID, if it expired yesterday and you're taking your exam today, they will not let you in. So you wanna make sure that you have valid picture ID, that it's up to date and that it hasn't expired and that the name on your picture ID matches the name that you gave to PSI when you scheduled for your exam. I've not heard any guys have issues with this. Usually it's the ladies. And that's where maybe they're getting a divorce or they're getting married and they're going through a name change and then the names don't match. So make sure that whatever name you use to schedule your licensing exam, it matches the picture ID that you bring with you when you take your exam. The other piece uh, I want to remind you is no hoodies, nothing with pockets, no hats, no watches. Nope. Just make sure that you don't have anything on your person that might put you in a compromising position that make it look like maybe you were cheating. All right. Make sure that um, I'm, they tell you not to bring your phone. People are going to bring their phones. If you bring your cell phone with you, turn it off. Do not silence. Do not put on mute. Do not uh, put on privacy mode or do not disturb mode. Turn it off. 
they will either have a locker, they'll have a locker for you to put your stuff, even though they say that they don't. And if it goes off and it beeps or there's any sounds that come from it, they're going to try to figure out which phone it came from. And if it's yours, they will basically dismiss you from the exam and you'll have to reschedule and take the exam again. So either you show up and you turn your cell phone off when you go into the testing center or you leave your phone in your car and you hide it somewhere. And then the last thing I am compelled to share with you is do not speak to anyone while your exam is in session. Do not talk to anyone. If, when you're on site and you're taking the test, they allow for bathroom breaks. Now, that I don't understand because I grew up, when I, when I was growing up, you know, they didn't give you bathroom breaks. <laughs> you had to sit and take the exam the entire time. And so when I found out that PSI gave you bathroom breaks, if you wanted one, if you needed one, then I was quite surprised. If you do that and you're in the building and you pass by someone that you know, do not speak to them. You are gonna, when you start your exam, this is how it's going to go. You're going to go to the PSI center and you're going to check in. You're going to check in with a proctor. So as I'm sharing what this experience may be like for you, I want you to visualize this in your mind's eye that you're gonna go to the testing center, you're, it's gonna, you're gonna find it easily, you're gonna get great parking because all of those centers have parking spaces. And when you go in, you're gonna show your valid picture ID, the person's going to check you in and they're going to give you a computer number. And that computer number is your lucky number. What is it? Whatever number they give is gonna be what? My lucky number. Yay, your lucky number, <laughs> no matter what number it is. Even better if you get number 13. So you're going to go to your computer and you're going to sit in front of the um, computer screen and you're going to log in. When you start, you're going to get a tutorial and we're going to go through the tutorial, a version of the tutorial at the end of this PowerPoint so you can be familiar with what the screen is going to look like. All right. You go through the tutorial. Now, I don't like tutorials. I just want to start in on my exam. That's how I am. <laughs> so uh, I had some feedback from students who told me, you need to tell students that there's a tutorial because when they showed up, they just wanted to start the test and this darn tutorial showed up. So, you know, it's like, don't get stressed yet. <laughs> don't get stressed at all. But as you, um, you sit, you check in, you're going to sign in uh, basically like a, an agreement, so to speak saying that you agree to the terms of taking the exam, and that includes that you will not speak to anyone other than the proctor while your exam is in session. When you go use the washroom, your exam doesn't pause or stop. It's still in session. So you want to come back. You don't want to talk to anyone. You want to come back, and then you want to resume your test. And I'll tell you why I want to emphasize this, because I had a student who did just that, who took a bathroom break, walking down the hall, spoke to someone in the hallway. She came back, and the proctor dismissed her from her exam and said, you can reschedule for another time. She didn't know. She was confused. She didn't really know what, what happened. It wasn't clear to her. And I'm sure she was in shock of, like, being dismissed from her test and not finishing. So she proceeded to call the Department of Insurance to reschedule, and she was unable to reschedule. Then shortly after that, she gets a letter from the Department of Insurance saying that she has a five-year administrative ban from taking her licensing exam because she spoke to someone in the hall. Yes. I called the Department of Insurance. You know, um, they know the situation, and this young woman had basically quit a six-figure job the, the week before she took my class to um, get into this career. Yes, very, very unfortunate. And uh, there was nothing she could do. If she wanted to fight it, she'd have to get an administrative law attorney to fight it. And obviously she didn't, she just kind of went on in her way. And I share this story with you just to let you know that time that you're taking your exam is just focusing on taking your exam. If you do need that bathroom break for whatever reason you, you need it, uh, do not talk to anybody, all right? And, and the other th reason I shared is because that could have happened to me. I'm pretty social. If I'm walking down the hall to go to the bathroom and I see somebody that I know, I might be that person that says, hey, how are you doing? But you put yourself in a compromising position and it actually looks like you're cheating, right? I mean, you're having this conversation. They don't know what dialogue you're having. You could be sharing questions. Now, this is where we're going to put the information for remote testing. None of you are taking remote testing, so I'm not going to go into it. But this is your exam. Whether you're taking the life, uh, accident and health or property and casualty exam, you get it a total of three hours and 15 minutes. Your, exa as your exam is made up of 150 questions and there may be an additional five to 10 questions. It just depends. Are they going to give you five extra or 10 extra? So you may end up with 155 or 160. 
those extra questions, they're basically validating those questions or checking for biases. They will not be used against you, nor will they count against you or for you. They will always score on 150 questions, regardless of the total number of questions you get. So they're mm -hmm. always going to score out of one. And the passing score is 60%. So here's the breakdown for your exam. For your life accident health exam, it's made up of 40 general insurance questions. 45 medical expense plans, four disability income, four long-term care, four health and disability general concepts, 49 life insurance, and four life policy writers, which gives you a total of 150 questions. Again, they may give you those extra five or 10. Regardless, your score will always be based out of 150. Now, the math is, I love the math on this, because 60% <laughs> of 150 means you only need to get 90 right. Isn't that cool? Because you can miss 60 questions. A lot of questions to miss. Like that's a third of the test. You can miss over a third of the test and still pass the exam the first time. Isn't that crazy? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's so funny. I had a student say, "Wow, so my insurance agent only needed to know sixty percent of what he's selling." <laughs> like it doesn't quite work like that. <laughs> but <laughs> you only need sixty percent to pass the exam the first time. Now this is a more detailed uh, description of the distribution of questions that they're asking. And I mentioned this, right? Uh, like when we talked about the life insurance policies, there's 10 questions there. When we talked about annuities, they're giving you eight annuity questions. When we talked about the Affordable Care Act, you're getting eight questions on the Affordable Care Act. And this actually got cut off here. Senior health plans, you get, you're getting 15 questions on that. You don't necessarily need to know the distribution. That's our job. And we structure our material around this distribution schedule, basically, that the Department of Insurance says it's in the educational objectives, and that's where we got this from. Your exam is based on the educational objectives. All right, it's for PNC, this doesn't apply to you. This does apply to you, however. This is the, um, the screen for the PSI tutorial, and we're gonna go there now. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing here. Oh, I should have copied the link, but that's okay. Uh, let me share screen and let's go here, share, and then I'm going to switch the tab. Is it going to let me? Yes. You guys, I'm going into psiexams.com. Are you guys on that? You guys are looking at the same thing I'm looking at, right? Mm -hmm. okay, cool. So uh, let's see. Let's go for government state agencies. California, California, different all insurance exams. Here we go. Give it a minute. And then under the tab exams, we'll go to PSI exam tutorial. So this gives you an idea of what it looks like, right? So it tells you about what it, uh, the question, it tells you the questions that you've completed out of the number of questions you have left, the number of questions you've answered, how many you haven't answered. Um, marked you and then the time uh, remaining or the time left. Uh, you have a, the function here to mark the question, to make comments on the question. Now I'm gonna give you some advice here and we have two schools of thought. My school of thought and it's backed by you know NLP and how the mind works and learning strategies and that is this is a computer exam. The strategies for a computer exam are different than the strategies for a paper exam. And what that means to you is that like being in front of a screen is like being in front of a television. You're getting one question at a time and it's out of sight, out of mind. And so if you go to, if you approach a question and you don't know what the answer is and you skip it or you mark it, subconsciously your mind is still thinking about that question as you're moving forward on your exam. So you're running this race, you're walking this trail, and it's made up of 150 points or 150 questions. And as you're moving along, if you skip one, you're hooked to that previous question because questions hook the mind. What do questions do? Hook the mind. Questions hook the mind. And so when we look at it from that approach, again, if you are... If you skip or you mark a question and you're still thinking about it, you're gonna, you're not gonna be fully resourced for the questions that you marked or that you skipped because the mind doesn't like ambiguity, so it's still gonna be thinking about it. Mm. So you're gonna be thinking about those questions that you left marked. 
So we're going to trick the subconscious mind. You guys want to trick your mind? <laughs> Even if you know how you're tricking it. <laughs> so what you're going to do is you're going to give it whatever answer you have in that moment. And we'll talk about this during the test taking strategies. You're going to mark whatever question you have in that moment. And then you're going to write the question number down on your scratch paper. One of the cool things is with uh, going on site is that they're going to give you a piece of, they should give you a piece of scratch paper. When you do your exam at home, there is no scratch paper, apparently. That's what I heard. I don't really know, but what I heard is you don't get scratch paper if you're taking your exam remotely. When you go to the testing center, they'll give you a piece of scratch paper. And what you're going to do is you're going to write the question number down. And you're going to move on to the next one. It's kind of like marking it, but you're not because you're giving it an answer in the moment. And you know the answer before you consciously know the answer. And your first answer is oftentimes the right answer. So you mark the answer, you write the question number down, and you move on to the next one. By the time you get to the end of the exam, you're going to have a list of numbers, right, of the questions that either you were not sure of or you didn't know. I usually have two columns, the, one I, the ones I didn't know and the ones that I wasn't sure of. And then you're going to count them. And if you have less than 60, because how many can you miss? 60. You can miss 60. So if you have less than 60, are you going to go back to them? <laughs> no. Why bother? Because one of the number one rules in test taking is you don't change your answers. <laughs> so why bother going back, right? So you'll uh, move forward, you'll less than 60. Now let me ask you this. What if there's more than 60? Are you gonna go back? Yeah. No, because you can't possibly, I mean, I mean, there's always a possibility. But again, your first answer is oftentimes the right answer. And why bother? Because you might go back and change the answers that's right. And I can't tell you how many times the student who misses it like by one or two, they changed an answer. They broke the number one rule in test taking along with all the other number one rules in test taking. But that's one you want to stick with is you don't change your answers because we have this body wisdom. We have this intuition and learning happens unconsciously. Haven't you ever noticed like you know how to drive, right? And have you ever driven home and then you're like, oh, I forgot to go to the grocery store because you just go into autopilot. We don't even think about the things that we learn. And a lot of times we don't even know we know things, right? It's that, um, that incompetence or I don't, I don't remember the learning thing, but there's different levels of learning. And one of the levels of learning is when you learn something, but you're not even aware of it, that you learned it. Right. And uh, when you're going through this methodology of studying by reading questions and answers, there is this subconscious learning that's taking place that you're not even aware of because through the repetition, the learning is happening and you're not even putting a lot of effort to it. There's a belief system that learning has to be hard. Our mind is an amazing computer and they still don't really even know the capacity of it. They say that we only use like what, 10%, maybe some optimistic person says maybe 20% of our brain capacity, <laughs> but, but yet most of what we do is just routine. It's what we did the day before until we are consciously trying to change it or do something different that's outside of our normal comfort zone. So all of these principles come into play of what we teach you and how we teach you to study, right? So do not use marked, do not use skip, if you choose to use them because you're gonna do what works for you. I'm simply making suggestions and I advise you to use those suggestions. But if you use, if you do your way, go for it. If you pass, awesome, more power to you. If for any reason you don't follow our, our principles or our test strategies and you don't pass the exam, then my invitation is that the second time you take it, you follow our guidelines. Can you choose an answer and mark it at the same time? Um, can you mark and choose an answer at the same time? That's a very good question. I think you can. I think you can mark it and then, um, but you know, where there's this, there's this kind of, um, what's it called? Uh, you know, like something that people say is true, but it's not true. <laughs> um, what's it called? Like an urban myth, myth or urban legend or whatever. Um, this is, we have one for this test. We actually have had it for all the tests. If you mark a question and then you don't unmark it at the end and you submit your exam, it's marked wrong. I don't know how true that is. So we, I just tell students, don't mark it. Don't mark it. Just give it the best answer you have in that moment. Because that's generally the right answer anyways. All right. So they talk about the function bar at the top and you're going to use a mouse. There's a calculator if you need one. Um, there's the status bar, which I've already described the questions, right? But they're gonna go through this, choosing an answer. You can either click it or use the keyboard and then you'll click next for the next uh, question. There you go, Mark. 
Uh, the candidate may choose not to answer the question or would like to review it, they can mark it by, but like I said, we don't want you to use that function, Charles. Um, if there's a question, I know when I took the exam several years ago, there was a question that I thought none of the answers were right. And so I made a comment <laughs> and said, none of these answers are right. The right answer would be this. <laughs> so um, then you have these go-to functions. If you do decide to mark, or uh, for example, I suggested to write on the piece of scratch paper, the question number that you weren't sure of, right? Or the question that you didn't know. So if you really want to go back to it, there is a go-to function and you can go to the specific question and you can put the number in the little box there and then you can go to that question if you decide to do that all right but if you want to um at the end right do you want to finish the sample portion that's the tutorial at the end to confirm that the candidate is ready to take the next portion of the, or or end the exam remember that are you sure you want to end the the test this is where students they're like a deer in headlights because then they second guess themselves. They're like, mm, I have time. Maybe I can go back and look at some of the questions again. Do not do that. Stop yourself. Stop yourself from going back. You're going to type in yes, and then you're going to hit next. All right. Um, but remember, once you hit next, that's it. Right? To end the test. So then there's going to be a survey that you have an option to do and all that other stuff. When you completed your exam, you're going to stand up and you're going to go check in with the proctor. And with the proctor, we'll give you your test results on a piece of paper and it'll be congratulations, you passed, and it will tell you how you scored in each of the areas. Now, these relevant links, my suggestion, do not buy these materials. You don't need them. You don't need them. This is the company that is testing you. Do you think that they want you to have the material that's going to be on your exam? <laughs> no, I can't tell you. I've had students buy their tests or their practice tests, and then they're like, I didn't see any of those questions that I bought. Of course, you didn't. It, they're not supposed to. That would actually, that, that would lose, the exam would lose integrity if they gave you the questions on the exam. All right. So, uh, Irma. Uh, yes, Serafina. They give you um, at the PSI exam sites, they give you a pass or fail, and then they email you your results. Oh, are you not giving you, you're not getting a piece of paper anymore? No, they email it to you. When did you take your exam? I took my PNC in August. In August? Okay, after August 23rd? Uh-huh. Oh, uh, yeah, because in August 23rd is when they started doing remote testing. All right, so you're going to get, but they're going to tell you whether or not you passed, right? Yeah, they do okay, on so site. You'll know they before do you leave. Okay, mm -hmm. cool. Thank you. So you'll know before you leave on the spot, which is, which is comforting <laughs> to know that. And thank you for the update on that, Serafina. Uh, let's see. Okay, so we're going to stop share with this PSI thing. Do you have any questions about the exam? That actually concludes that part of the PowerPoint. You know, um, Emma, I just missed the last, um, on the breakdown of, of the percentage of what's the, or, you know, the test, like 40% was general. I just missed the last one. I'm just curious. I mean, it's, 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 it's okay. Let me see. Um, it's um, after 49 life insurance. Um, uh, let's see, let me go back here. Was it? Yeah. Uh, four policies. Four life policies. Yeah. And, and the four life policies, remember that one chapter four sheet that you got to fill in the blank, to fill in with the words to know list from chapter four? That has the, um, on the back side are the policy writers. And you would have seen several of them on your quiz this morning, like the guaranteed insurability option. You'll definitely see that one, the accelerated death benefit, the waiver of premium. Those are commonly asked questions and those are common policy writers that are added to the policy. And then the other one is the cost of living adjustment. So make sure you know those, those four policy. There's more than that. Those are the four that you're likely to be tested on though. And then I think I mentioned before that, like the guaranteed insurability option, when can you buy more coverage? At any time? No. They're going to specify under the guaranteed insurability rider, they're going to specify in the policy when you can buy additional, when you have the option to buy additional coverage. So make sure you remember that. All right. Are we ready to move on to the next, uh, to the test strategies? Are we good? Mm -hmm. All right. Let's stop that.